Hello world, first in your roundup of hacking news, you might want to disable Bluetooth because iPhones, Macs, Linux PCs, and I know you Android users don't like being left out, so you're also vulnerable to a new exploit that allows hackers to remotely take over your device using Bluetooth. For a hacker to exploit this, no special equipment is required. Armed with just a computer and a cheapo Bluetooth adapter, an attacker is able to emulate a fake Bluetooth keyboard and force, say for example, an Android phone to connect to it. I can't go into the technical details on how this works, for reasons I'll explain later, but this is what the exploit allows someone to do connect a fake Bluetooth keyboard to your phone. This is way worse than it might sound because you can completely control an Android device just using a keyboard, which gives an attacker full control over it. It's kind of like having a Bluetooth bad USB or USB rubber ducky. You've probably heard of those things that you can just plug into a computer and it'll open up a terminal window and type in a bunch of pre-programmed commands, potentially hacking a computer in a blink of an eye. An attacker could do something similar here. However, it wouldn't require them to even touch your phone. And the bad news is, for Android users at least, by just having Bluetooth enabled, you are vulnerable to this. When it comes to iOS and macOS users, you guys are vulnerable if you have Bluetooth on and if your device has at some points been paired with an Apple branded Magic Keyboard. Oh, and as a side note, lockdown mode does not prevent this. Linux users are vulnerable when their Bluetooth is discoverable. This exploit is the result of flaws in the underlying Bluetooth protocol itself, combined with implementation-specific bugs that are the fault of manufacturers. And this vulnerability has been hiding in our devices for ages. In Android's case, this dates back to 2012, back when the Samsung Galaxy S3 was the most popular phone of the year. If you want to see a real-life demo of this exploit in action, well, you're going to have to wait, because the researcher who discovered this, one Mark Newlin, hasn't released proof of concept code or even explained the technical details of how this really works, because he's waiting for manufacturers to, you know, actually release patches. But he plans to unveil the exploit at a hacking conference in January. Counter-Strike players have had an interesting couple days, but before we get to that, cybersecurity professionals, listen up because I need to tell you about today's sponsor, PlexTrack. What if I told you penetration test reporting doesn't have to be a time suck? With PlexTrack, you can rapidly generate a pen testing report in as little as five minutes. Using the content library, you can easily pull pre-written narratives and findings write-ups into your report and just edit the specifics so you don't waste time copy-pasting from previous engagements. Shortcodes help keep your report modular and reusable across pen tests. And PlexTrack makes your peer review workflow easy. Adding comments and collaborating across your team is a breeze. The goal with PlexTrack is to set your formatting and create reusable content once, then present your best work every time. Build consistent, high-quality reports in a fraction of the time by automating with PlexTrack. Use the link in the description now to sign up for a one-on-one -on -one personalized demo of the platform so you can finally make what was previously a mundane and time-consuming task easy. Counter-Strike players have been subjected to all kinds of colorful imagery after an HTML injection bug was discovered in the game's kick panel. This was script kiddie level easy to pull off. All someone had to do to exploit this was to change their username to an HTML image tag, and when a kick vote was called, whatever image inside the tag would be rendered on everyone's PCs. Now, I don't play Counter-Strike because, well, I just suck at it, but I can just imagine the kinds of pictures people were subjected to, which was confirmed when I saw all the videos of this floating around on Twitter. A secondary problem here was that this could be exploited to grab players' IP addresses. A simple script on a web server could just monitor the IPs that loaded an image. And given this is Counter-Strike we're talking about, you can bet a bunch of people were DDoSed as a result of this. This HTML injection bug originates from the fact that Counter-Strike uses Valve's Panorama UI framework, and the very first line in the documentation says that it is heavily influenced by and closely resembles modern web authoring, HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. And herein lies the problem. The whole UI is built with HTML. So if a username contains HTML, then the user interface will treat it as such. Though it's not like the developers didn't foresee this problem, because you can clearly see the HTML isn't being rendered here, rather it just seems the devs forgot to toggle HTML for this particular panel. An emergency fix for this has already been released, so yes, it's totally safe to play Counter-Strike without being bombarded with NSFW pictures. But this bug was never really all that serious in the first place. Whilst there were warnings that this could potentially allow a whole lot worse than just people spamming you with spicy pictures, that really was the extent of the bug. 
However, the warnings were warranted because just a few years back, there was a critical vulnerability in CSGO that not only allowed an attacker to spam you with images, but also inject JavaScript and potentially take over your computer. So if you see a similar bug to this in the future, in any game, then it makes sense to get the hell out of there. In what seems to be a world first, a government has actually admitted to hacking another country. Ukrainian intelligence services published a report owning up to the fact that they hacked the Rosaviatsia, probably butchered that, it's otherwise known as the Russian Federal Air Transport Agency. It's comparable to the FAA in America, responsible for overseeing Russian civil aviation. Ukraine didn't say how they hacked the agency, just referring to it as a complex special operation in cyberspace, which in reality could have just been the result of them finding a reused password. Ukraine exfiltrated a bunch of documents from the agency, analyzed them, and published a long list of findings. But the main takeaway here that Ukraine is using to further their propaganda war is that the civil aviation industry in Russia is on the verge of collapse. The hacked documents reveal that due to sanctions on spare parts and even software updates for aircraft, Russia has been forced to stoop to aviation cannibalism, which is when some aircraft are dismantled to repair others. This has led to the number of aircraft malfunctions to triple compared to last year. The Ukrainians even made all the stolen files freely available for download, or at least you could download them until the hoster seemingly removed them for terms of service violations. And whilst the documents themselves are interesting, and I'll link the dump below because after reading this, I wouldn't want to fly on a Russian airline anytime soon, the real news here is Ukraine publishing this report in the first place. I mean, governments never admit to offensive cyber operations, let alone publish the findings of a successful hack on their website and let you download the files. Even famous hacks like Stuxnet, that we all know was the work of Israel and the US, has never even been acknowledged by them in public. After all the hacktivist drama of the past couple weeks, the leader of Killnet is apparently retiring. Now, I have a whole video on all the recent drama, but in a nutshell, the Russian group Killnet has made a name for themselves by DDoSing the websites of people they don't like. As a result, they've got a hell of a lot of media attention, which has earned them quite a following on Telegram. The group is run by Killmilk, a mysterious character who only ever appears on camera all masked up. But Killmilk has made a few enemies, and a couple weeks back, over 10 of his disgruntled former comrades teamed up with Russian state media to de-anonymize him as allegedly one Nikolai Serafimov. At first, Killmilk, well, or should I say Nikolai, didn't seem to care about his identity being exposed. He even made fun of it, sharing my recent video and just laughing at it. But that laughter was short-lived because he's now decided to retire, focus on family life, etc, etc. This is hardly surprising. I mean, how can you run a hacktivist and, well, borderline cyber criminal group when all your enemies know who you are and where to find you, so it's not like Killmilk had any choice in this? Though, whilst Killmilk is disappearing, Killnet isn't going anywhere. Killmilk has appointed Dianon Club to take over the group. I hadn't heard of Dianon Club before all this, but after doing some research on them, it seems they're very much cut from the same cloth as Killmilk. In fact, they've collabed before, creating something called Infinity Forum. It was yet another cybercrime forum teaching black hat skills, though it doesn't look like it ever took off, with Killness and Dianon Club selling it off earlier this year. Dianon Club has announced large-scale recruitment for the Killnet team on all fronts and told their followers to expect new adventures. What that's all look like in reality? Well, stay tuned to find out. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.